Well, what I'm all about right now is try to grow a plant that's suited to where you live. So like if you live in Colorado, grow some Colorado native plants because you won't have to spend hours changing the soil and babying it. It's used to living here and so it's gonna do well. Also, plant in big swaths of things and that's better for the bees and it's easier for you and the plants are happier because they naturally grow in big colonies like that. So I garden for the ecosystem and for intense life in my garden. So I'm Cynthia Scott and this is my garden in Boulder, Colorado. We're right in the foothills under Flagstaff Mountain. And um, what we're about to see used to be a soccer field when the kids were little. And a couple of years ago, we decided it was time to get rid of the bluegrass lawn. And um, so what you see is a work in progress because gardens are always a work in progress. And it's the beginning, well, it's actually the middle of June now. And um, we're just in the wild stage, starting the wild stage. It just gets wilder and wilder. So come on up. <laughs> We, got, we brought in all these boulders and love it when we happen to get a little special plant. So we've planted a lot of things like this Rosa Woodsii that's a native plant. We tried to plant a lot of native plants down here, but also a lot of um, step garden plants. And I've been on the board of the Denver Botanic Gardens for years and really influenced by their step garden and was on their gardens and conservation committee when they designed that. And so I was very inspired and wanted to try to do that. So I blatantly copied them <laughs> and you'll see the step garden rocks over here. And this is our um, buffalo grass lawn. And I can't bear to mow out some of these wildflowers that come into it. These little erigerons have blown in. They open up later in the day. And I can't bear to cut down these beautiful blue flax. So this is the, this is sort of a meadow, <laughs> even though it's really the lawn area. But these are the step rocks that I was talking about that are just exactly copying the Denver Botanic Gardens. So it's, it's great to have a place that can inspire gardens of our own. And this has a lot of little plants that I've gathered, Paniote, Caladis, and Mike Bone, and Mike Kinchin at the Denver Botanic Gardens have been really good at telling me which plant I should have. I'll describe like, I want something that's gonna bloom in September and, and it has to be this tall and this wide and, and they give me great recommendations. So this little anemone is sweet blooming now. I like this one and these little um, penstemon are cute. This garden is ever changing and all crowded and munched by the deer, but keeps coming back. This is a, this is a um, Heath Aster that when I bought it, I said, I wanted something that's going to be low and hugging the ground. And it ended up being really tall, <laughs> but there it is. And I just have to leave it because I, I love it. And it's, it's, I garden a lot for um, the ecosystem and biodiversity in my yard. And so I have, I let the clover go because it's great bee food. I have a lot of native plants that are great for all the native butterfly larvae and all that. And, um, and so, yeah, I don't cut things back in the winter. I let everything go. I let things go to seed. They pop up here and there. So I'm always surprised in the garden. And this, I have a garden and it's just basically me and my husband taking care of it. And I have a few people that come to help with the lawn and such, but it's way too much for me to be a, a pristine gardener. So I go for the meadow look, which is what we see over here. Oh, and come and see these. This is a sort of a new garden that I, I had to put in because I got overrun with mint that came down in the flood. So I'm putting in some natives like this Pinstemon strictus it's the first year and look at all these little native bees that are coming out to visit it. 
I spend a lot of time in the garden just looking at the, there's a little osmia, a little, uh, oh, there's a sweat bee, a bright green sweat bee, other little sweat bees on here. I see all kinds of big bumblebees. So when, when I started putting a lot of natives and when I started leaving the leaves over the winter, like piles of leaves, I suddenly have so many more creatures and I walk down and it's full of sounds and buzzing and butterflies and, and it's really been really fun. This is a native plant, sneezeweed. Um, we spend a lot of time hiking up in the mountains and this is one of my favorite ones. It usually has tons of bumblebees on it up in the mountains. And so I planted some of that last year. So that's been fun. And here's my clover garden, which is always full of life. Lots of bees and things. And underneath it, I have purple prairie clover about to come up and the gallardia over there. And it's foxtail lily time of year. So it's middle of June. And over here, you can get a sort of a long view of the foxtail lilies. Um, which is another thing they have a lot of at the Denver Botanic Gardens, people might recognize. But this is Gallardia that I love. Um, a couple of different varieties in here. This one is the true native, it has the daddy long legs on it. It's Gallardia aristata. But these are just coming into their glory, the foxtail lilies. They start blooming from the bottom and they bloom, 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 bloom up towards the top. And they have a really nice long bloom time, which I like. If you don't give them too much water and too much love, they do better. <laughs> well, that orangish one is called Cleopatra. That's probably my favorite color. And there's different kinds. I have this, this pink one or maybe, yeah, this, these are, this is a different kind. I'm not sure the name of that one. That's sort of a very, very light shell pink. And then the dark, the big white ones over here are robustus. And we can maybe get a close look at the pollen on these. The pollen is incredible. But these are really, really tall. And these are not as far along just because they're in the shadier part. And, um, but look at the, long long pollen on those big bumblebees love these and little tiny bees love them oh look those see that orange poppy in there that is a gift from paniote <laughs> he gave those to me last year and i planted about 10 of them and i think i have about four of them that came back so i hope i can encourage them to continue yeah, the Penstemon got totally smashed by the late snowstorm we had in May. We had over 15 inches of snow and it started and just kept going and kept going and all the plants were starting, standing up beautifully. I was very excited because I'm having my niece's wedding here, not the actual wedding, but the big brunch before the wedding. So I was like, oh, but Everything got smashed down, so now I have a lot of curving plants or a lot of plants I'm trying to stake up, but I'm not a stake it up kind of gardener. So it just, this year, it just as long as the hummingbirds can still get it, then I'm fine. So if I stake something, it's only because I think that the birds and the bees can't get it. But I love the blue flax in the morning. We'll see if it's blooming up at the top of the garden. This is a whole bunch of GM Triflorum that's gone to seed. It's got these wonderful seed heads. And this won the um, plant of the year from the Garden Club of America one year. And they have a Freeman Award that gives an award to um, a native plant every year. And this is pretty much over blooming. Here's what its blooms look like. That's past it's sort of an old bloom but but yeah I love these little seed heads that come but I've really been a gardener since I was born because my mother and my grandmother are both big gardeners my father's an architect and my mother's landscape designer and they 
I mean, I just grew up in the garden. That's what I did for summer. I went out and deadheaded petunias at apartment buildings. And so I learned plants that way, but I also grew up in Colorado. So hiking and being in the wildflowers is my favorite place to be. So um, then you start, once you start gardening, you start noticing other things in the garden. And then back in about 2005, um, I got some honeybees and when I got the bees, the honeybees, I decided that I was going to go out in the garden and see if I could see my bees. And I saw so much more than bees. I saw all the native bees, the bumblebees, all these things I had no idea even existed. I would never notice them in the garden. So then I started really, really paying attention to all the, um, the little creatures. And that's my passion right now, I would say, is like the, the bees. And I, we have a small organization called the Bee Chicas here in Boulder. So it's four um, beekeepers that got together and decided we would have a mentorship program with each other just to help us learn how to keep bees. And that has really morphed into um, really being interested in the native bees out and um, the ecology of the gardens. And then we teach a lot of kids about the, um, all of the native bees. So they come in because they think that there's only one bee and that's the honeybee because they know about honey, but then they're just wide-eyed when they hear that there's like a thousand different kinds of bees in Colorado alone. And so we've, and if you have native plants, then you have the native bees. And so that's sort of like evolved that way. This is a whipley anus pinstemon that I love. Oh, and there's one little blossom of this. Is also, these are also step plants from the Botanic Gardens. This is a Patagonian petunia that I love. And this dianth. Oh, it, it, later on, these are going to start blooming. This is um, one of those beautiful coppery ice plants. Well, this is sort of a way where you can showcase at a lower elevation what grows at higher elevations. And there's a lot of plants that will do okay down here in these lower elevations, but they need to have special soil. So we brought in um, soil that's, that has a lot of squeegee in it, and it's not very rich, not a ton of compost. So these plants thrive in heat and a lot of the native plants have really long roots like this buffalo grass the roots of the buffalo grass go down eight feet to get the water so this is really good this is sort of an area of the yard this is used to be the soccer field and it was completely flat and we brought in all these boulders and piled them up but this area and that area are more like um, rain gardens sort of like water sinks and so I didn't know if the buffalo grass was going to do very well, but it's doing very well. <laughs> but it, it grew in pretty well. And it, it, the other thing I like to have is multicultural lawns. So I'm not the type that wants a pristine bluegrass lawn. We'll go up and I'll show you my more traditional part where I have bluegrass, but my bluegrass is not just grass. It's full of everything. It blooms and it has life in it. and it's a big expanse that I was thought was so wasted if it was just green and no flowers for the bees. So Oh, and this is our, our let me see if there's any wrens in here. This is our um, chickadee project we've been doing with the University of Colorado. And this doesn't have chickadees, but this year it has a wren nest in it. And I think it might have babies, so let's see if it flies out. Let's see. Oh, newborn hatchlings in there. Let's see. Baby wrens. And now they're studying the wrens at CU as well. So the wrens come after the chickadees, and they're known as the little bullies of the little brown birds. But um, sometimes they, oh, there she is, I think. The mother wren. Oh, she, she was right there. She flew away. She's saying, what are you doing looking in my nest? But yeah, so, they st so the wrens come after the chickadees. And sometimes if they come early, they'll kick the chickadees out of their nests and take over. But this year it was just wrens. So 
Yeah, this is our meadowy area that gets really wild. <laughs> Oh, these are iris that my mom brought me from her garden. She brought me a few, like maybe two or three, probably 15 years ago, and they've just gone wild. They're great. They last for a split second, but when they're out, they're, they're really beautiful. There's some right there. Now, the poor, poor peonies that got completely flattened. Sometimes, if I get a good year, when it hasn't snowed, this can be just beautiful. Or it can be sort of flattened. <laughs> Every year is different. So now we're in the more traditional part. This is like up by the house. And the garden's designed to have more natives and naturals on all the edges. And then the middle central area of the garden is more, you know, er, um, suburban i guess you would say or you know with more traditional plants and traditional lawn this was a 1910 farmhouse when we renovated it we renovated it in 1998 and um, it's the same brick that was on the house but when we started in the t construction project and took the windows out we learned oh my gosh you have two brick walls that aren't tied together and the mortar is completely crumbling so we had to take the whole house down basically down to the stone foundation i've got this little broom which is just about over this is a little um a native iris that i got from harlequin's gardens harlequin's is a great native nursery if people don't know about it here in boulder if you want natives he's got them the alley, I'm always making a nice show in, in the springtime. It's pretty much an all-season garden. I started, you know, everything that you buy is probably a lot of things are at their best in June. So this is probably the peak flower for now, but I've been really trying hard because it seems like I have a lot of things that happen in September and people want to come see the garden or I have things and so I've been really trying hard to get things that bloom late also. And also for the bees, I like to stretch the seasons. I, I like to have really, really early spring things and really, really late fall things. And so um, late fall is another burst, I'd say, in my garden. If it blooms, I let it stay. <laughs> this is a beauty bush. It's almost over, but Colquitzia. And when we had to redo the hillside that was sliding for the the flood in 2013 we had to bring huge equipment in here and we had to cut down about three big evergreen trees to get the equipment up because the hill was sliding and all the soils engineers were here and we had to evacuate for a little while and they said well it'll take out the barn your house will probably be okay but it'll probably slide down and go down this traditional swale that's on the side of our yard and so we moved out for a couple of days and then we came back and then we decided we're going to stay here. And so we fixed it and the guys from Yenter, which do all the work on I-70, <laughs> came and they, we have big 10 by 10 foot concrete panels holding back the hillside where the mudslide is. My husband, Peter. <laughs> I would like to say that it is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to do the heavy lifting <laughs> under the direction of Mrs. Cynthia Scott because what she's doing is such a benefit to the neighborhood, to the world at large. Um, I don't know if you've seen the bees that we keep uh, and the flowers all without any pesticides and so the bees are free of neonicotinoids and all that so happy to be part of, of it. <laughs> this is a native choke cherry which I love and so do the bears. The bears come through the yard often and they love choke cherries so they just walk on through hopefully. A couple of times we've woken up with dogs barking and barking and we have seen a mama bear and a few cubs. They love this oak tree. The, the bears love this tree, so they come and sit in it a lot. One time when Hank was a puppy, I was walking in 
from picking, you know, doing the groceries or something. And I was right here before I noticed that there was a mama bear standing right against the tree. And there were two cubs up in the tree. And I had Hank. Luckily he was on a leash because he was a young puppy and I didn't want him to run away. But he, um, he didn't even notice the bear, basically. We kept walking by. She hissed at me, and I just said, Sorry, Mrs. Bear, and I walked right past her, and all was fine. Hank did that. Is that Hank? Yes, that's Hank. <laughs> no, you stay down. But no, you wait. This oak tree is a, is a, probably should be a champion oak. It's a cross between a red oak and a swamp white oak. We had an oak expert, one of my friend's brothers was an oak expert, and he looked at all the leaves. A lot of the leaves are pointy like this one, which is sort of like a red oak. And, but there are some leaves, especially up higher in the tree, that are very rounded. And so it was a mystery, so they decided it's a hybrid. Yeah, and these are Norway maples that I have on here and then on the other side of the garden also. And this is a stream, a recirculating stream that we put in. It's the second iteration of it because the first one started leaking after about 10 years. And so we renovated this and put a lot more native plants around the, the stream as well. Um, but I'm not strictly natives. I think adding natives wherever you can is great, but I just incorporate them into my regular garden um, wherever it's appropriate. We could walk up these steps. This is where we put a lot of woodland plants and there's not, there's some natives like that nine bark. And then there's this, I love this um, Japanese Hakliokloa, I think it's called the lime grass. So pretty. And of course, the little um, campanulas. <laughs> this just finished. I've been trying so hard to get this dodecathenon to bloom. And I think I planted two, one one year, and it didn't come back, so I planted another one. And then they both bloomed this year, and one is white and one is pink. So I think it's actually two plants, not one. <laughs> and the iris, again, these are different. These are not natives, but they, they have their about one week of splendor every year and then the foliage is nice but when they do bloom it's lovely the rocks these rocks when we redid the house in the late 1990s um, there was a house right where we're standing a little cabin like a one-room cabin that someone lived in during the war and um, it had a little pot-bellied stove in it so that's the only structure that we took down from the property and um, so the architect was Jamie Logan, who's, she's still practicing here. And she was very talented and she, we just sort of conceived of the whole um, house and landscape together. And because the whole point of our house was to live in the yard, basically. And so, so we conceived of the whole idea. And then we had um, Kimmerer Marcus come and do help me with the landscape design to begin with. And she is wonderful and she sat in the yard and just, you know, really got to know it, got to know the, you know, what it felt like and, and, and spent a few months figuring it out and drawing it. And we've pretty much kept that. These rock walls are all made from rocks that were existing. They were in smaller rock walls around the property or they were just in the ground when we dug out to put the foundation in. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of work. I built about a one four foot wide area of, of the rock wall and it was hard work. These are, these are like serious battered walls that, that are hand built and hand laid. So you can tell they're not like 
perfectly symmetrical, but that was the beauty of it for me. And this area used to be just grasses and natural, but at one point I used to have lavender down in the orchard area where we were. And of course the orchard trees grew up and there was no more room, no more sun for the lavender plants, which like a lot of sun. So we took the grass out on this garden tier and put all lavender in. And every year we have a lavender party and um, I've got a whole bunch of ribbons and everything down there. People always say, why do you have all your ribbons outside? But it's because we make lavender wands and lavender things out of these plants when they bloom. And that's usually the middle of July that it's peak. These plants are hid coat. And um, the, I like the hid coat because they have a, when they bloom, they have a purple bract and a purple flower. Those are more about to bloom. And then in the back, I have um, Grosso or Provence, which is a later blooming, taller French variety. And um, those are better for lavender wands because they have really long stems. But yeah, these are really old plants now and starting to have to turn over and start to replant lavender. It's not really that long lived and now it's also getting shadier and shadier in this. I don't know where I'm gonna put my lavender next. <laughs> But this is an ancient apple tree. And we're also on the um, Boulder Apple Tree Project because Boulder used to have apple orchards all up and down the foothills. And then prohibition came and they had to cut a lot of them down because they were using the apples to make hard cider. And so that when prohibition came, that's why they, they took them down. Um, but this is one of the ancients and um, it makes delicious tiny, I don't know exactly what it is, but they're trying to figure it out. They're doing some genetics testing on it and they're gonna hopefully tell me soon what kind it is. <laughs> it's delicious. They're small, deep red with sort of a green spot on them and they're tart and sweet. And it might be either like a, it tastes kind of like a Johnny or maybe a um, Cortland apple, we'll see. Well, yes, there's actually a bench right down there my dad made me and I put it down there because we never go there. In fact, I didn't even take you there. Um, but yeah, he made that bench out of old redwood from his old deck and we like to sit there and just kind of overlook the garden. We also like to put chairs under that maple tree. Like when we have people over, we'll put a couple chairs there because you have a nice view of the the whole yard but really whenever we go for a glass of wine at before dinner or whatever we always come up here and we walk up to the open space which i'll just show you now oh this is the boulder that came rolling down during the flood of 2013 and we were gonna move it and the crew said "Ooh." it's too precarious it might we might roll it further down and it's really heavy so then they talked about how they could break it up by like drilling and putting like a little dynamite in it or something that would crack it and finally my husband said let's just move the wall because that wall was over here and we just moved the wall kept the rock and then somebody was here who said oh i can put a little sign on it for you so yeah. <laughs> we have that <laughs> oh it's it's sort of blooming. It's not as intense as, as, it, as it has been earlier, but you can just see this is the area where the flood came down and we ended up having to make a ramp for the machinery to get up there. And instead of taking the ramp off, it's sort of a boulder catchment now and we call it our rocks and we go up to have cocktails on the rocks up there. <laughs> and that's where we go to see the view. If you're game and want to walk up there, we could. Oh, and I look, I have some wild Monarda blooming, which I'm, oh, and there's another stand of it over there. That's a wonderful plant. And this area is what the whole thing looked like until we disturbed it. And then we got some sweet peas coming into it, which we're always trying to get rid of, but they're still really good. Um, bumblebee food and I think our bumblebee population has increased because we have the sweet peas now so there's good and bad for everything 
This is pretty steep, but... So you ask where we go? It's here. <laughs> we like it. You can see the city. We saw a big lightning show last night. And of course we have great views of the flat irons from here. That thicket has gotten so overgrown and we're letting it do that because it's a great cover for the birds. And it's also a catch basin for the boulders. So hopefully they'll come to this flat area and stop before they hit the house or they'll get caught up in that thicket. So it's kind of a protection thing as well as a great place for the birds and a really good early nectar flow for the bees, which is nice. Of course, with my gardening mother, I've gone to different botanic gardens all over the world. And um, what I've really noticed is that every culture is a gardening culture. We all are. We came from that because it's our food and it's our folklore of our you know, sense of place for all different cultures. So I think the garden is a really great opportunity for a place to come together with diverse communities to talk about a common love, which is plants and gardens and food gardens and really fun way to um, compare, you know, what do you guys do for how do you grow your favorite foods and that kind of thing. So yeah, I love the garden in that way. So this is the vegetable garden. This was a um, victory garden during the Second World War. And so we kept the vegetable garden in the same area when we redid the house. And now it's totally overgrown because yeah, I have peas in there, but I'm letting these old carrots from last year bloom because I love it. it. It attracts so many little bees when these carrots bloom. And the lettuce and the peas I'm trying to protect from the dogs. So I'm also letting all these things grow up around them. <laughs> but the vegetable garden has evolved into basically a flower garden. <laughs> we grow a few things like we grow tomatoes and we just planted our beans, but um, Pretty much the vegetable garden is now for the bees as well. And so, and these are the bees. Got four hives. Yeah, these are really productive hives. I have to have this enclosure because I mentioned we have bears. Bears love honey and they love actually the larva. So they'll go wreak havoc with the hives, which they did before we had this nice, structure which is like a greenhouse <laughs> with no glass for the bees so um, it's been a great pastime it's a ton of work and I have a lot of fun with it but I wouldn't recommend it for everyone I would recommend um, having native bee houses which are a lot easier and just going out and observing in your own garden you'll be so surprised how many little things are out there that you never noticed before so and I let things like I let my arugula bloom because it's great for the bees. And if it has a flower, as I've said, I love it. <laughs> so yeah, we've, it's a wild, wild area. This, are Rosa, this is Rosa Glauca, which I love. And this only blooms for like a short second also, but look how much the bees love it. They're, just so happy getting a lot of pollen <laughs> and these bloom um, wildly for a second and they're so beautiful but this is Gertrude Jekyll she's a prickly one um, but it's beautiful rose all of my roses are wild and hardy and they're on Canadian rootstock and they're not they're not fussy because no one gets any pesticides or any special treatment in my yard <laughs> so you have to be tough this is Victorian memory oh it smells really good some people don't like the way it smells but this one has gone wild it's gonna get trimmed after it's done blooming 
But yeah, these start out really small. I got it from Harlequins and it just, they go wild in about the fifth year or so. Oh, look, this is a mock orange. This is a native plant, a native mock orange that blooms beautifully. It needs pruning at the moment, but, <laughs> um, but now shh, we're going to the secret garden. <laughs> Okay. So this is, was basically just a small garden. The front door of the house used to be over here and we moved it to be the back door. And maybe we should come back over here and get the view from this direction. because this is sort of the front entrance of this garden. Um, yeah, and that's a hot tub over there. We should have taken the lid off because it looks much better without the lid on it, but it's um, just a quiet, shady spot. So when it's really hot in the summer, we end up eating dinner out here where it's nicer and cooler. And also this became the workout room and the, everything during COVID. <laughs> so it's, it's a, Good spot and a lot of woodland plants I used to live when I did my landscape design training I lived in New York and I did it at the New York Botanical Gardens and so I wanted to grow a lot of woodland plants and then we moved to call back to Colorado so I was born here then went to New York and then came back so this is sort of my woodland plant and it's it's really best in the spring because I've got a lot of bulbs that come in up in here a lot of primula and I have dog tooth violets and sort of woodland plants. I've tried trillium and may apples and things like that that come up in the spring. And they like, it's been a challenge because they like fertile, sort of more acidic soil. And here we are under these um, Norway maples. And so the trick I finally figured out after about 15 years of trying to plant everything in here is that I leave the leaves all winter long and then in the spring I every now and then not every year but I put compost over, right over the top of the leaves and I leave them all the time and the soil has gotten much more fertile and I finally have coverage in here before it would be just a lot of bare ground but this is sweet woodruff that's expanding everywhere which is a Colorado native or for a woodland native and then I have this epimedium and helleborus and you know, this is colchicum, it looks terrible now, comes out, the foliage comes out in the spring and then the foliage dies back completely and then in the fall, just the flower pops up. My grandmother used to call them surprise lilies because they just popped up at, with no foliage in the fall to surprise you. Uh, and this is our perennial foxglove which is another fun one that the, the bees really, really love. And this is really hardy and it, it'll seed itself, which I wanted it to do, and it's, it's kind of spreading over in that area. So this is one of those areas that I, I want the, the most tough plant. And people say, oh, don't put that in your garden because it's too invasive. But I'm like, oh, I'll put it in the secret garden because that's what I need. If it's shady and tough, I like it. Oh, and this is Daphne transatlantica. And this is one that Paniotti recommended to me years ago and I bought it. The plant was literally as big as this sprig in a tiny little pot. And it's a Daphne that keeps blooming and blooming all year. It just finished blooming, but it now has buds and it'll keep on blooming. It'll have another flush of, of bloom um, various times over the course of the summer. So that's good. This is another totally wild brambly area that is roses and lilacs and just it does its own thing. But it, we have a lot of birds and we have a chat that it's a yellow breasted chat and they are, have a beautiful sound and they love it in here. 
they they have an amazing call they they sound like a duck and they sound like a wren and they make all these amazing sounds oh look at the catalpa it's the catalpa season it's blooming another great bee plant bee tree which was here when we moved in but it was also really small i probably could have put two hands around the trunk now it's big here's more of this foxtail lily oh and this is a bristlecone pine that peter got as a gift and it was literally a tiny thing in a one gallon pot and we put it there and 15 years later that's what it looks like <laughs> also a native plant and you can tell it's a bristle cone because it has these little white pollen spots on the needles that's the way you can tell it's not a foxtail or something else oh and this is where is a good example of the multicultural lawn we just mowed it but it's gonna bloom again <laughs> very soon and so it's full of life and full of nectar for the bees. Because if you're a teeny tiny little sweat bee or a teeny tiny perdita, you might only fly as far as the length of a soccer or of a football field in your entire lifetime. That's as far as you fly. So imagine a lawn for that type of a little critter. It's like a vast desert with nothingness. But now they have all these delicious things they can eat. Clover in here and over here. I've got some, I guess, Lysnacea jumped out here, but this in the spring is a, um, a little Veronica filiformis that hopped out of the garden. I don't have it anywhere in the garden where I wanted it, <laughs> but it hopped and it's really happy in the lawn. So I let it be there. So this is the potting bench that I was telling you about. Got soil here. And so this is where I pot everything up. I do a lot of transplanting and then I can just sweep everything into the compost. So I start a lot of annuals um, in the spring and I've taken some, so with the Garden Club of Denver, so I'm incoming president of the Garden Club of Denver and I've been in there for many years and we've done a lot of propagation projects with like Mike Kenshin who is great at propagating natives and Mike Bone, Paniote of course. Just start. Go to the nursery, ask for natives, always ask for natives because the more we ask for natives the more the nurserymen are going to start growing them and they just look right here in Colorado. So and just have fun and plant enough. If you're planting a big swath then you won't freak out if the deer come and eat three of them and browse in your plants because you'll still have a, enough left. I, I learned that you have to just plant enough for yourself and the wildlife and then you'll be happy. <laughs> so, yeah, and you don't, and I say don't use any pesticides because the minute you start killing one thing, you're killing a part of the, the um, food chain. So for instance, I, I probably have some aphids I, somewhere at this point. Yes, I do. See this plant? It's covered with aphids. But I love that because I know I'm gonna have ladybugs really soon and they're gonna eat the aphids and I won't have to bother clearing them off. And, um, and then I fed the ladybugs and I fed many, many things. Aphids are, are food for many, many other insects which feeds the birds, and then we have the, the happy ecosystem. So I garden for the ecosystem and for intense life in my garden.